if you can make videos and put them out there and you can have conversations on Twitter in, in which you can articulate certain kinds of views, men can't get pregnant, you know, blacks c commit disproportionate rate of crimes for whatever reason, let's have an honest conversation, not a hateful one. I'm not talking about calling people names here, right? And you're yeah. not either, obviously. Yeah. We want good faith discourse, but you're right. I mean, it is, tr this, and I, I think what happens is that when it's a, when that becomes a successful strategy that is making conversation out of bounds it incentivizes progressives to turn every conversation into a moral debate instead of a, a empirical debate because why debate about say immigration or you know demographic change or race and crime if you don't have to if you can just win the debate by hurling moral accusations at the other side and then silencing their speech. Welcome to the Veritas Podcast. I'm Scott Veritas, and today I'm joined by social psychologist, conservative commentator, and returning guest on the channel, Bo Weingard. Bo, thanks so much for being here again. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. Look forward to it. Yeah, it's always good to have you on. You've been here a couple times before. A quick note for you know listeners and, and viewers. If you want to know more about Bo personally, I don't plan on getting into that too much in this interview just because he's been on the channel a couple times before. So you can go to one of my previous interviews with him on the channel. I think he's been on twice before. I'll probably link those in the description down below as well. But instead of that, for my, my first question, I want to ask you, Bo, about just kind of all of the seemingly kind of big victories that the right has been having in recent months. I think there's actually been more optimism <laughs> in the in the kind of conservative space than I've seen in a while. Namely, things like, you know, Elon Musk being on the verge of acquiring Twitter. I know that's not completely done yet, but he seems to be pretty close, although there is an, a pending, you know, not pending, but a currently uh, hatchet job political attack on him right now, trying to prevent that from going through. But also, mm. Disney seems to have lost a head-to-head -head battle with Ron DeSantis over gender propaganda. The Supreme mm. Court is on the verge of, it seems very likely, overturning Roe versus Wade. That could happen as soon as, you know, a couple days from now, uh, even before this interview comes out. Um, and the other one I was thinking about is that the disinformation board, I'll put that in quotes, disinformation board, which was lovingly <laughs> referred to by many conservatives as the Ministry of Truth in Biden's administration, that was suspended very yes. quickly. So there have been these moments that actually feel pretty good if you're on the right, particularly the Elon Musk thing that kind of set off a whole celebratory thing on Twitter. And if you add that to Biden's really abysmal approval ratings, what seems like it might be a red wave in November, as a conservative, do you kind of feel a little optimistic right now, or do you think this is a mirage? Wow. that's a Yeah, that's a good question. Um, no, I don't feel optimistic, <laughs> but we have to take each, each thing as it comes. The red wave, so yeah, I mean, that's better than nothing. But some of these candidates are getting wackier and wackier, at least from my perspective. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, like, for example, in Pennsylvania, <laughs> just, I mean, of many examples. Um, and what I worry about what this is suggesting is that it is still Trump's party. I mean, Trump just has a stranglehold on the party still. And I don't foresee that changing and that means if he wants to run, he's going to win next time. So the only question is, will he run? And I, you know, that's a coin flip to me. Hmm. And that's depressing to me because I am not a fan of Donald Trump. But we can put that aside and get to that because that's a huge topic. Um, the Roe Wade is interesting because although I want it to be overturned, I think it was, an I mean, just an abysmal, atrocious decision. And so was the Casey, which mm. is actually, actually, we live under the regime of Casey, really, mm. but because Casey did update a lot of things in Roe. Um, but I personally am pro-choice. So that that's this weird one where I would like a pro-choice, let's say up to 15 weeks, because I would want to compromise with people who are pro-life. Mm -hmm. But I personally am pro-choice, but I also think that the decision was terrible and should be overturned. So I'm happy that it appears as though it will be overturned. Yeah. We'll see what happens with the, you know, we have the draft from Alito's opinion. At minimum, that's going to change a little bit. I thought it was actually like a pretty good opinion. Mm. Um, the e so, and then the other two things you brought up, I actually, I, I 
don't have strong views on. So you brought up Elon Musk um, buying Twitter. I, I don't know what, I, I don't have strong views about that one. And then the DeSantis and Disney, I, I actually, I don't know enough about the underlying dispute there to comment mm-hmm. intelligently mm-hmm. on it. I mean, I mean, I think we can say in general that we're seeing a, a bit of a populist backlash against woke capital, mm-hmm. if you will. And I think that's a general statement that's fair and that DeSantis is a, is a sort of a good representative of that. But I don't know enough. I, I mean, each case is complicated and there are complicated things with Disney that I don't know enough about mm-hmm. to talk intelligently about. Yeah, that's fair. And it's probably something that more people should do when there was something gets brought up that they don't know anything about. I mean, uh, most <laughs> of the people on Twitter are usually talking out of their ass. I mean, you mentioned a few things yes. there. Your position on abortion is interesting because it's very close to my own position. And also, I, it, our position is pretty much what most Americans have. I always bring this up in conversations about abortion is that m- when you poll Americans, almost everyone wants abortion to be largely unrestricted in the first trimester and pretty heavily mm-hmm. restricted after that. Uh, right. And maybe a little bit into the second trimester. People generally draw the line around 12 to 16, uh, definitely 20 weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the Roe v. Wade thing is interesting because people do seem to think it will drum up a lot of enthusiasm on the left. Like a lot of mm-hmm. young women will come out and vote, but it, it does sort of have the stench of something where the ship has already kind of sailed. Like the types of women that are really in a furor over it, I think had already planned on going out and voting blue in November. Um, the I do want to I really want to address your first point though about the kind of wacky candidates uh, all across the country that might sort of throw a monkey wrench into what hopefully looks to be a red wave in November. Uh, right now in Pennsylvania, it's, you know, like Dr. Oz of all people yes. is, I think, <laughs> uh, a thousand votes ahead of a more uh, right. establishment Republican Mainstream. candidate who may yeah. in a recount take the lead. It actually is very, very close there. But yeah, that's, that's I, I have asking. been thinking yeah. a lot about Dr. Oz and Herschel Walker, who are both Trump yes. candidates. Herschel Walker yes. is virtually guaranteed to win his primary. He's running like 50 points ahead of his nearest competitor. Dr. Oz, it's maybe a, uh, maybe maybe 60-40 in his favor right now. It's, it's kind of unclear. But I, I have been frustrated by that as well because I was looking at the Senate map and I was going, if we give up those two races, because I do not think there's going to be a Senate or Dr. Oz, and I'm not sure there's going to be a Senator right. Herschel Walker. I, I just, right. I, I don't really think that's the case. The Democrats have a very good candidate in Pennsylvania. They have an incumbent in Georgia in these two races. It's, it's hard to imagine. I, in a really big red wave, maybe we get Senator Mehmet Oz and Senator Herschel Walker, but it's very hard to imagine. But then again, Donald Trump did take you know make a new precedent on what the unimaginable right i mean his presidency was unimaginable so maybe he'll be true, working yes. his magic once again if you his magic if you can call it that but um it, it it is frustrating because i mean you look at the fact that uh what's his name madison cawthorn nearly won his primary and he's been one of the the craziest of the crazies um he did actually lose very narrowly but there is it, you, you are right when you say that Donald Trump continues to loom his shadow over all of American politics, including over the Republican Party, despite the fact that he's no longer in office and the fact that he is generally quite unpopular nationwide. Well, right. That That's sort of the problem is that he's so popular among the Republican base, but nationally very unpopular. So, like, I think... How could you lose, let's just say right now, because a lot can happen in a couple of years, but right now, if you were to have a presidential election, running Donald Trump is about the only way you could lose as the Republican Party, as far as I can tell. I mean, you, what we should do, I think uh, uh, most Republicans, like at least most Republican uh, politicians and pundits, privately think DeSantis they would love to give (laughs) the primary to DeSantis. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the best candidate who can synthesize the various factions in the Republican Party and compete best on a national stage. But I don't think DeSantis would even run if Trump ran. I I just can't see that happening. Uh, And even if he did run, he would probably get demolished by Trump. And the problem with Trump, of course, is not you know, whatever his policies are, that gets complicated. It's his personal flaws, which are so manifest and, in my view, abhorrent. And, I mean, now he has January 6th around his neck, and that should cause 
concern and shame. I'm not saying that would lose them that many voters, but it's just one more thing that the, I mean, think of how unified the media will be against him. And if he wins, it's hard to imagine what the country will look like in terms of like the hysterical outrage and backlash. Uh, yeah. So it's, and also like one of the things that is interesting is it's not even just that Trump's sort of uh, endorsed candidate is always winning. It's that I'd have to look at the specific races, but in, in many cases, the best candidate is the one who goes more Trump than Trump. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it's not that they're repudiating Trump. It's actually, they're even more Trumpy than Trump. Is. Yeah. It's... <laughs> and a lot of this is, is disconcerting because it's like Madison Cawthorn. Now he did lose, but Madison Cawthorn is like, he's not... He's not an impressive politician because he has good policy ideas. He he's all about just trolling the libs, and it, it's like his first I care tweet about after policies. he won last cycle was a uh, cry more liberals. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. What could be more indicative the of Madison Cawthorn? The second he won, Cawthorn? the second he got the AP check it's mark, just he was... like a paper mache politician whose only like only ability to to <laughs> do yeah. to accomplish anything is to anger libs. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that that I don't like, and I I care about certain issues. You know, I care about immigration. I care about slowing down or scaling back some of the excesses of the sexual revolution, etc. These are the things that I care about. I don't care about angering my my liberal friends, right? Yeah. Well, and and Trump is such a poor spokesman for these issues. DeSantis yes. would be far superior much pretty better. much every way to say because yes. because look i don't want somebody who's a completely neutered candidate i think somebody like a nikki haley right. probably doesn't have what it takes no, to really get you know what i mean like there are right. people i do i can compromise with the trump people on dissent like that's kind of the thing that we're both saying yes, that a lot of people would exactly. say is like we right. we also don't want like a mitt romney or a or a nikki haley right. or somebody who's completely kind of out of the loop on just how bad things are desantis yes. has struck such a perfect balance and that's why i'm so optimistic about if trump doesn't run i think desantis right. will wipe the floor with every other candidate yes. with all the Nikki Haley's with the Tom Cotton's with the everybody um, <laughs> it's going to be it's one of three people or maybe okay maybe like one of four or five people will be the next president of the United States on the Republican side it's either going to be DeSantis or Trump on the Democrat side there's actually more options than just Biden it could be Kamala Harris it could be Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg. Pete, I, yeah. I have been saying if the Democrats are smart they will let Buttigieg Buttigieg on paper is such an unbelievably good candidate I've been so confused yeah. why he is not and again, I actually don't he's like him. He's a white man. I, but, well, he's, he, he, he's a white man. Well, and he, right? he has an Obama-esque charisma to him that, yes. uh, not quite to the level that Obama did, but he has a, right. um, if I didn't know very much about him, I would assume he was a very smart, uh, a very patriotic, you know, he's a former veteran. Uh, right. But, but getting away from kind of the inside, you know, I know it's a little bit inside baseball, not everyone likes to talk about electoral politics, and back to just kind of the the philosophy of what's going on right now. Donald Trump, he, I'll share this with my viewers. This this is an interesting note that I don't want to leave out, which is you mentioned something really interesting, which is you can't even imagine if he were to win a non-consecutive second. To just none of us are able to think that far ahead yet because it was, you know, we, we've been two steps back recently where we were thinking about the 2020 election, all that. I will say this. I My attitude towards that as I've started to maybe come to terms with the possibility of Trump winning again has been the absolute bedlam. The absolute insanity that will ensue if he does run and if he actually wins, which is possible because Biden's very unpopular. Yes. I will be really, really terrified of the consequences of that, except in the first 24 hours, because I will just enjoy the absolute insanity of it. It will be it, I'm going to take I've, I've, just, I've made a deal with myself where I'm like, if Trump wins again. The absolute, which will be worse than 2016, absolutely, I guarantee you. Oh yeah, worse than 2016. Yeah. The absolute meltdown that will take place in the media among a lot of people that I do not like on the left. I I know the long term consequences are something I'm going to have to deal with, but in the first 24 hours, I'm just going to enjoy it. I'm just going to enjoy the meltdown because it will be un, it, it will be truly unhinged. I mean, it's going to be insane. So yeah, you know, we're 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 talking about this sort of. The Schadenfreude that I'm I'm looking forward to enjoying if this does right. happen. I, but and believe me, I don't want it to happen. I would prefer a Ron DeSantis presidency. That is my kind of optimal result in 2024 out of the realistic possibilities. Um, in an election between Biden and Trump, I'd probably just write someone in again. I don't even know what I would do. But um, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of been my my thoughts about it. 
I mean, those are my thoughts. I, yeah. I don't know what I would do either. I don't have, um, I don't have any, you know, important ideas about it other than I hope it doesn't happen, yeah. but I'm worried that it will. Yeah. To a certain extent, it's, it's too far away. There are so many different variables leading into it. We'll just have to, to wait and see, but something that is closer at hand that I want to delve into a little bit more is something that has felt like on paper, the biggest victory for the right in recent memory. Uh, at least since the 2016 election. And as we were just kind of saying, you could argue that wasn't really a victory for the right, depending on the way you look at it. <laughs> but the, the near nearly finished acquisition of Twitter by Mr. Elon Musk, which has a, a, you know, a last minute uh, threat to it via some very specious accusations of sexual harassment that uh, we'll see how that plays out. But th this has been something that for a lot of people, I think, has given them more optimism than anything in recent memory for people on the right, because it threatens to take something that is a major arm of the woke orthodoxy's propaganda, you know, apparatus, which is social media and especially Twitter, and it takes it largely out of their control. Elon Musk is not very woke and he is very, very pro free speech from what I can tell. Do you think that not so much on the optimism front, because I know you already kind of answered this question, but do you think this is something that could even ever be replicated as a strategy in the culture war? Because it seems like a almost kind of a one-off thing where, you know, how many times can you get somebody who's worth, you know, $300 billion to just <laughs> right, buy exactly. a social media platform? Right. Do, do you think it's something that actually pr pr sort of presents a path for people who want to address social media censorship? Or is it just this one-off thing that could never possibly be replicated? So I actually think this gets to maybe difference in opinion that you and I have because I tend to be more skeptical of these kinds of solutions or uh, moves in, cult, in the culture war. I, I think I don't want to minimize the importance of top-down power because obviously it has effects, but in general, I think it's not a substitute for like on the ground persuasion in, because it, and you're right in this case this this is i think like a very unique situation and furthermore i would caution that we should wait to see what it will actually do because if i it, it my prediction is even if musk does take over twitter it won't change a lot there, there are some things that will change i think probably for the better i think the rules will be more clear and more fairly applied and I think that's important. I don't want to minimize that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe like misgendering won't get you booted off anymore, right? And maybe we wouldn't have had a few of these things that were transparently motivated, you know, motivated by transparent bias. The Hunter Biden laptop story that was suppressed, for example, um, a couple other examples and what counts as misinformation. I'm not sure that it will move the the culture war that mm. much though i mean again i don't want to minimize that for people who love twitter that might be really important and having very fair clear transparent rules that's important but i mean i don't think this is going to like things that i care about let's say immigration for example or having honest conversations about demographic change or scaling back some of the excesses of the sexual revolution and transgender ideology i don't know that this is going to do that much and in mm. fact you know, you're just going to have a hysterical backlash and you can already see what's happening. And it's, I think it's gross. Um, I think th this, this is what irritates me. What vexes me about these things is you can see like the mainstream media playing into the worst stereotypes of their critics, their critics, you know, there's the, their critics claim they're this cult cabal of elites want to, take us out and they don't play by the rules and they just besmirch us and hurl you know aspersions at us and then that's what they do <laughs> that's time. what they're doing there's this very like coordinated attack on elon musk and everything he stands for there's this new you know this new york times piece about his growing up in south africa and, and i mean trying to besmirch him with uh, intimations that he was somehow associated mm. with anti-black racism there i mean just really gross and unseemly um so yeah that's been disheartening i guess it shouldn't be surprising at this point <laughs> but it, it, it's still disappointing but i don't you know again like i don't want to minimize it i think i i hope it'll make the rules more clear more transparent and more fair 
but look, most people aren't on Twitter. I mean, it's easy mm-hmm. to if you're on Twitter and you you engage a lot on there, it's easy to mistake that for the real world. And and I don't even want to minimize the influence of Twitter because some things that start on Twitter certainly disperse into the quote real world. But you know, for the a lot of these cultural battles, we have to persuade a lot of people. Yeah. You know, it's a huge country. We're not going to get some president who's just going to give eloquent speeches and suddenly 20% of the population is going to shift their views. Mm. Yeah, it's. I'm generally in agreement with you that kind of the reason I framed my question the way that I framed it in terms of can you replicate this, you know, success, which I don't, I don't want, I was going to say small success, but I don't want to say small because it is the acquisition of a major, you know, sure. public discourse platform. But yes. I do feel that in order for this to really, like, I would be v- very optimistic if Elon Musk had somehow done this on all of the major social media platforms. If it was like YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, if he actually, but j- with just Twitter, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I'd rather have it than not. I'm very excited yes. about it as somebody who does <laughs> use Twitter. And by the way, who has, I have had to not post tweets that would be considered misgendering. I have actually had right. to, and this is something I still do on YouTube is at one point I wanted to, and this is, this is where I want to get into the other side of it though. I do think this is important if you can replicate it, because let's say hypothetically you could replicate this and that's a big hypothetical, but if you could replicate sure. this across all social media platforms on mm-hmm. YouTube, there is a whole genre of you know, heterodox commentary that is heavily self-censored right now. People yes. don't want to get to the <clears throat> I will admit my own channel. I wanted to do at one point a video essay about um, the trans propaganda that is uh, directed towards children, particularly stuff on Nickelodeon that I had seen with drag queens. And I remember sitting down to script the video. I, I sat down to script the video about this drag queen singing to children on Nickelodeon. And I started scripting it. And I was like trying to find a way to script it without breaking the terms of service that mm-hmm. they have changed about a million times in the past three years. And I right. literally couldn't do it. I was like, I cannot right. talk about this. I can't because I I really wanted to make jokes. Like that was I was like, I cannot talk about this without right. making it funny. It is funny. I can't possibly do this video without making jokes. And I literally couldn't think of a single way for me to even like have that conversation the way that I wanted to and do that essay. So I do feel like if you could replicate this across all platforms, Mm -hmm. you'd see what I think you're going to see on Twitter, which is people will be able to say that somebody who is a man, not talking about anyone specifically YouTube, but somebody who is a man (laughs) is a man. Or vice versa, right. people will be able to say Men that. That's can't an Im- get yeah, pregnant. yeah. So yeah. just being able to say that, but that's important <laughs> right. to me. I think that actually does help because it means that the conversation is actually happening without. I mean, the way I've been thinking of it lately is there are there's a completely there are completely mainstream positions. There are big policy debates where one side of the debate is completely not legal. Like it's it's just taken out. I mean, not legal in like the sports sense, not in the actual legal sense. Yeah, it's like out it's of bounds. Yeah, it's out of bounds. Sense. It's yeah. to, to just to, so it's sort of like if you're playing a football game and one of the teams just wasn't allowed to touch the ball. Like it's if right. you can't say that a man is a man and a woman is a woman in a trans right. debate, like you, it means you can't make your argument. So I do yes. feel that that element of it has been really bad on Twitter. It's been painful to yes. see people working around that. It's just unbelievable to see. And so if we can get back to the point where we can state the obvious across all social media, I think that actually could move the needle quite a lot just because of what it opens up. Because you did see before things got really, really censorious in the last like three years, there was some positive movement, I feel, in like 2017, 18, with people sort of leaving the left. I mean, I was a big part of that. And I think it was largely because people were able to make these arguments in a more straightforward way. So my hope is if we somehow could replicate this success, and it's very hard to replicate, it's under very unusual circumstances. But I do think it could actually move the needle if it was replicated across all all the major social media platforms. Yeah, I mean, you're talking to somebody who cares a lot about, say, human variation, immigration, demographics. These are topics that have been censored for quite a while, yeah. right? I mean, um, you know, we can talk about the Buffalo shooter and just the massive hypocrisy on the left about demographic change, but try talking about race and crime on YouTube. I mean, it's brutal. Heather McDonald had a talk. It, 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 it wasn't erased, but it was marked for adults only. And all it did was talk about just concrete race and yeah. crime data, right? Yeah. So yes, no, I I do agree about that. I know I. And that's why I'm saying I don't. 
I don't want to minimize that because you're right. That is important. If you can make videos and put them out there and you can have conversations on Twitter in, in which you can articulate certain kinds of views, men can't get pregnant, you know, blacks c commit disproportionate rate of crimes for whatever reason. Let's have an honest conversation, not a hateful one. I'm not talking about calling people names here, right? And you're yeah. not either, obviously. Yeah. We want good faith discourse, but you're right. I mean, it is, tr this, and I... I think what happens is that when it's a, when that becomes a successful strategy that is making conversation out of bounds, it incentivizes progressives to turn every conversation into a moral debate instead of a, a empirical debate. Because why debate about say immigration or you know demographic change or race and crime if you don't have to? If you can just win the debate by hurling moral accusations at the other side and then silencing their speech. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the sports right? metaphor version of that is they're just constantly going to push you out of bounds. And there's exactly. no way you can possibly yes. move the ball forward. I know people who right. don't watch football are going to be a little bored by this part. But yeah. like, as a sportsman, I just think of like, you can't score any points if you can't touch the freaking ball. And that's what yeah. happens when you can't right. even state. Like everything you said was just like starting with factual assertions that are important if you want to articulate something that is even remotely right of center. Like, people are right. generally aware, especially people who live in cities, who read the news, that black people do disproportion, uh, commit disproportionately more crime than white people. And, of course, you're, the way that they try to push you out of bounds is they say, oh, so you're saying black people are inherently more criminal. Like, this is just yeah, part exactly. of their nature. And it's like, no, no, no. Right. That is the attempt to push you out of bounds that is aided heavily right now on social media by the people controlling it. But really, that's just you stating the position so you can have a more nuanced conversation about like, yeah, we can talk about why that is, but we have exactly. to acknowledge the statistical fact, <laughs> the undeniable <laughs> fact first. Right. And, right. and, this is, and if you can't have is, that conversation, you're in really bad shape. Right. And this, this really bothers me because there are a lot of even, like I would say, intelligent progressives will argue against things that are actually indisputable. Like, I'm like, look, we can have the debate about causes, but the data are clear. <laughs> and like, to me, it's an embarrassment that you, not you, but you, this progressive person, this progressive, let's say, professor, is not aware of these data. But the reason you're not aware of them is because they are suppressed. They are suppressed and they are pushed out of bounds. And then people who are aware of the data are afraid to say so in polite company or on Twitter or on YouTube for rational reasons. They're afraid of either getting kicked off or of, you know, provoking the wrath of other people. And, I, you know, this happens to me maybe, I don't know, once every two months I get retweeted by some progressive and then all of a sudden, like, something you should never do is search your name on Twitter. But once in a while I'll do it just for fun. And then all of a sudden it's just like, 60 tweets of people dunking on me and oh look at this you know <laughs> yeah. right and like look i i have a whatever peculiar mix of traits i have i don't really care people i don't care if people hate me it doesn't bother me mm. but it really does bother a lot of people understandably we're humans we're social animals so people are afraid to do it to, to talk about these things for those reasons um i think it's a shame by the way not only because it leads to the defeat of policies that I want, and I'm, I'm sure you want as well, but also because it moves these conversations underground where they become darker and more sinister and more conspiratorial. Mm. And I think that's what we saw, for example, with this Buffalo shooting. You know, you see somebody who they, they glom on to something that's true, but it's it's been contorted into this, you know, like nefarious, <laughs> the elites and yeah. Jews are doing this to you. And because there's a little bit that's true about it, they they find it more tantalizing. And I think if we had these conversations above ground, outside of the sewer, in the sunlight, and we were honest about it and more judicious about it, I'm not saying every, you know, like it wouldn't ruin all conspiracies. There'd still be conspiracy theorists, but it would actually, you know, it would significantly reduce the appetite for that kind of like BS, yeah. that, that more dangerous BS, I think. And, and I think that's really important. Well, and it's, it's such a sick strategy because you're right that people are kind of pushed 
underground. And then, of course, they're called, you know, alt-right chud incels. But then exactly. this, this, these, exactly. these alt-right chud incels, maybe <laughs> they end up committing a mass shooting, which is horrible. But then what the media does is then they tie it back. They say, oh, what? I mean, recently there was a whole bunch of the, the Buffalo mass shooting has been interesting because the media used it and they've done this before, but this time it was very uh, overt. They use it then to sort of bring everything for full circle and say, actually, this guy's ideas are the ideas of like Tucker Carlson. See what Tucker exactly. Carlson, see what mainstream exactly. Republican figures have been saying. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then, so it's this weird yes. cycle of like pushing people down. Somebody does something terrible, which unfortunately happens on both sides of the political spectrum when people are of really, course. really in the fringes. Um, right. And then they use those tragic events to try and smear mainstream Republican thinkers. I mean, Tucker Carlson's about as mainstream as he's one of the biggest, he's, I think he is the biggest, single biggest conservative commentator right. in America. And, right. and, and for, to my knowledge, he I remember one time he did a monologue about like diversity is not always necessarily a strength, which is, it's Obviously politically incorrect, true. but it is undeniably Obviously true. Because true. <laughs> I always make this argument, and I'm sure this is, you've tried to make it, maximum diversity by its definition, can't be a virtue. And the reason is because, like, diversity in in moderation can be, but depending on the kind of diversity you're talking about. And there, there's right. ways that diversity can be a good thing, 100%. It can be a strength. But if you were to maximize it, bring it to its, its maximum possible potential point, that is obviously not optimal for society because you reach a point where nobody has anything in common. Like, that is maximum diversity, is nobody has any right. shared values, it would any be, shared culture, yes. anything right. at all. It would mean that no two people have anything in common, which is obviously, like, if you just do that very basic analysis, diversity is our strength is obviously a terrible slogan if you take it to an extreme. But but if well, you I but mean, if you say that, you're tied in with the Buffalo mass shooting. It's like, oh, you're talking about, you know. Right. No, I, I I agree. You're right. It's it's been appalling to watch this, be, and, and I think pur purposefully, the media and left wing analysts that I've seen, or just left wing, uh, you know, professors on Twitter, have made this sort of purposeful conflation between th three things that I think are important to keep separate. One is demographic changes happening, and Jews and elites are. Uh, promoting it on purpose against the will of whites. Okay, that's one. Two is demographic change is happening and it benefits Democrats. Three is demographic change is happening pretty quickly. Okay, now those are three separate arguments. Mm -hmm. The first one is a conspiracy theory and is wrong. So we can put that one away. That's, I'm not going to say the, the Buffalo shooter's name because I think it's a good idea yeah, never sure. to use these people's names, but that's the one that he had absorbed. Okay. Well, let's throw that one out. That That is a pernicious conspiracy. The second one, demographic change is happening and it benefits Democrats. You know who's advocated this more than anybody? Democrats. I have, I'm, I happen to be writing an article about this because I was so sort of vexed by the dishonesty of the media and left-wing analysts here. So I went through all of these articles Demographics are changing, yay. Demographics are destiny. Look at all the, there are like seven books about this, about how it's awesome that demographics are changing because it's going to promote liberal policies in the future. There's this quote by Patrick Reddy, in an, uh, he's a Democratic pollster, in an art, uh, he was writing an article about um, Ted Kennedy's legacy. And he said, Ted Kennedy, you know, like the greatest part of his legacy was this immigration reform because it's going to make America more liberal for the foreseeable future, right? <laughs> so they applaud it. But when you're a conservative and you say, well, wait a second, maybe we should be cautious about this, then it becomes a conspiracy. I call this the... Um, the Copenhagen interpretation of demographic change. So it's like, if you know the Copenhagen interpretation in quantum physics, so it's basically like demographic change is in this superposition state. It doesn't exist until you celebrate it or you condemn it. And if you celebrate it, then it's great and it is happening and fast. And if you're concerned about it, then it's not happening and it's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah, there's a great meme on Twitter on the right about, because this is what the effect you're describing, which I'm not familiar with the, the physics concept, but I, I think I have a basic understanding of what you're saying in terms of how it translates here. It, it, uh, it applies to many things. And the meme that you see on the right is X is not happening. And then X becomes undeniable. And so the left turns to X is happening and it's good. And that happens yeah, exactly, so quickly. Exactly. That happens so exactly. quickly. And this is one of the best right. examples. Like it used to be that right. like, no, no, the LGBTQ 
uh, uh, alliance never does anything with children. They never say anything to children. And then we see a little bit of that happening. Now, I'll, and by the way, I'm not going to go in the groomer direction. I actually do think that there's an argument to be had about whether or not we use that specific word. But it's sure. undeniable that right. there are there's a targeting of children in schools by certain actors who want to uh, indoctrinate them. That's the word that I like yes, to use absolutely. into this ideology. And for right. a while, that was like, oh, no, that's not happening. We would never do that. And then it started right. undeniable evidence through libs of TikTok was coming out. And again, I would dispute maybe the use of the term groomer. That's arguable. But it becomes undeniable. And then it just becomes, well, this is a good thing. And it's like another right. one of these examples, just like with the demographic change thing. I mean, I'll make a confession. I was a democratic activist for many years. I always used to happily talk about, I used to be like, oh my God, all of these Latinos are moving in. We're going to win all these elections. That used to be me. That used to be me, bro. And to my audience, I'll freely admit it. That was Scott before he was Scott Veritas. That was me. 100%. I can confirm Democrats talk about it all the time at our little cocktail parties. We're always talking about how great it is that all the Latinos are coming in and voting Democrat. That's just like undeniable. And so the second you talk about it, even in a neutral way, that's the thing. Because I mean, maybe Maybe, I mean, yes, it's it's easy to twist it if you talk about it in a negative way, because I guess the implication is that you it's, it's the way that a journalist would look at it is like, oh, I'm going to write the headline, you know, Republican politician says they don't want Latinos in the country because and even though it's right. more complicated than that. But right. even if you talk about it in a neutral way, just acknowledging it is like right. considered uh just like you said, the media all of a sudden, you know, their eyes set fire. And it's so funny because it was talked about in a positive light. So many times in, so in many recent times. history. I mean, the demographics right. or destiny thing has been used to yes. drum up democratic excitement. Right. For the, people were writing books about this in the early two thousands, yeah. and 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 were you know absolutely celebrating it. And again, like I don't have a problem with people celebrating that if that's what they want. I understand that, but then you can't pretend it's a conspiracy when conservatives have concerns about it. And I think what we're talking about with this conflation is what particular, what I find particularly nettlesome because it means that if I want to talk about demographics candidly, judiciously, let's have a debate about it, then the media conflates what I'm saying with the great replacement lie, which is this, this Jewish elites are leading it, which isn't true but again it's not something that like tucker carlson has has not promoted the idea no. that this is led by a coterie of elite jews right? that's always a good so, litmus test is once the the jews are the puppet masters of the particular theory that probably means it's a crackpot that's always kind of my my like the way i know things go too is, far on the left is very particular it's like when there's violence and equity involved on the right it's always when the jew and by the way i am ethnically jewish a lot of people know this and so i'm always kind of like i was not invited to that party if we are Control, please send me an invite. Get me my, my letter from Hogwarts that says I get to go to the Jewish control center. It is an interesting... I, I always am like, I, I am right. unaware of this. I would love to be a part of this if it is real. It, it, yeah, you're, anytime there's kind of a conspiracy that's on the right somehow, Jews somehow get involved in it, which is <laughs> it is weird. No, to, to the demographic thing, though, by the way, is like what I find bizarre is this double standard. And this is the double, double standard. So suppose that we have two groups of 10 people. And let's suppose somebody says, I want 10 white people in the one group. And then the other person who's a progressive says, I want diversity because diversity is good. So let's say they get a group of, I don't know, four white people, three black people, and three Asians. Okay, both of those are concerns about demographics. But for some reason, only one preference is racist. The other preference is good. And that's a kind of double standard. I think we see more and more of these double standards that are no longer viable in a, in a society in which whites are a dwindling share of the population. And, you know, it's a, it's a complicated issue. And that's why it's so important to talk about it honestly without smearing our opponents or claiming that they're promoting some great replacement theory. Yeah, it's a very hard conversation to have while the media is kind of poisoning the well and basically make it, making it so that anyone who talks about this in anything other than a completely glowingly positive way exactly. is tied in with white supremacy, domestic terrorism. Yes. It's a very obvious strategy. Right. We've seen it a million times before. It just kind of keeps accelerating to this point where just acknowledging the thing they've been talking about for decades gets you put on on the list. Um, it's interesting you bring up the double right. standards with diversity. The other funny thing about the uh, the example you were giving is if the group if the if group B 
was, let's say, uh, it was something like, you know, four black people, three Asians, three whites. Um, let's say it was, you know, five black people, uh, three Asians and two whites. And then you took out for whatever reason, like one of the Asians quits and you put in a white person. They would actually not consider that increased diversity, even though right. it technically, <laughs> That's it, right. like, like technically if That's you right. make it more even, per, <laughs> like they would be like, no, only yes. like it only works one way, which is very, because right. technically it is, it, it was funny. I, um, I never. Mind. I was going to say something about where I work, but I don't want to. I'll just say I was working in a place. It'll be very hard for people to find it if I just say that I was working in a place where there were not a lot of white guys. And when mm. I joined the staff, somebody made a little joke, and it didn't bother me that much. It was just a little joke. They said like, "Oh, you know, this is diversity for us. We're getting a white guy." And I was like thinking in my head like, "It is funny, but it actually is true. It's true. Like, it, like right. it, you actually are getting diversity by hiring me." Right. And. Um, you know, it, 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 the thing is most people would not consider that diversity. When people ask for a diverse candidate, you don't go and look at the races of their current employees and go, <laughs> right. Oh, well, technically I'm actually diverse. Right. Even though I'm actually, white. Like, no, it means not white. <laughs> right. So actually I think it's funny because I, I bet a lot of people would say that NBA is more diverse than the MLB because the NBA is more black. And in yeah. fact, the NBA is less diverse, right? It's, it's enormously disproportionately black relative yeah. to the MLB. And you're right, because I think we understand at this point that di diversity is a rhetorical tool to promote certain minorities. Now, it doesn't have to be that. And we could have a concept of diversity that maybe some people like and some people prefer, you know, people with different personalities might prefer more homogenous values and areas, whatever. We can debate that. But right now, diversity is largely simply a rhetorical tactic to promote the interests of certain groups yeah. and those groups are not whites obviously it's it's a euphemism for race it, it honestly people yeah. when they say <laughs> yes. no it really is because when people yeah. say diversity yeah, right. they do it not is. mean diversity uh, uh intellectually culturally yeah they, they, that's sometimes right. they kind of oh it's about sexuality and religion not really a little, typically it, it is very race. explicitly race yeah um, you're right yeah that's true. So, so yeah. th that that court sort of is proof positive that yeah, it's it's very much become a rhetorical device, a euphemism, which is a shame because it's actually an important thing to talk about. Like you do want a certain amount. You can have not enough diversity. You can't like just like I said before, you can't maximize diversity to try and make it. You can't minimize it. If you have a bunch of people who think, look, and act exactly the same, you end up in your weird autonomous hellhole. You know, it's 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 a nuanced discussion that currently has zero nuance to it very much because of what the media is. Well, hearing. it's not it, right. It's not even possible. You know, it's one important thing I think for conservatives is just to, and I guess this is what you were getting at with, with Twitter and some of these other social media sites is the, I, I think it's just important to get some of these conversations into the mainstream and to be able to have them, to be able to have a conversation about, you know what, look, some people don't, they want immigration to slow down because they actually are worried about too much diversity. They don't feel comfortable with it. The way it is now, if you make that claim, and I know because I've made the claim, you're just bashed as a racist, a, a conspiracy monger, a white nationalist, even though every other group gets to have its own interest and to promote them. Gentrification. <laughs> Why is that such right. a concern? Exactly. What if all the white and that, people that, move into the neighborhood? <laughs> right. And actually, like Eric Kaufman has interesting data that show among conservative Hispanics and Asians, for example, they actually feel an attachment toward like a dot, like a, an America with with a, a larger percentage of white people than progressives want. Mm. Right. That is to say that they also worry about demographic change mm. because they're uh, what they're what Kaufman would call ethno traditional nationalists. They're not white nationalists, obviously, because they wouldn't be citizens in a white nationalist country. Like almost nobody in <laughs> who seriously wants to have this conversation is a, a real white nationalist. No. It's just a bogeyman. It's it's a cudgel to you know beat. Uh, uh, political enemies, and I, I find that so loathsome and just disconcerting because it does, as you say, again, it just we can't even have these conversations. You can't even say, yeah, you know what? Actually, a man can't get pregnant, or you know what? Like, I don't want to see a quote-unquote pregnant male on a model uh, as a model. Like, you know, I more power to the person. I hope he or she has like a good life. I want. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not even trying to be facetious. Like, I do. 
But I don't, it's not attractive. And like, can we just say basic truths about the world without being called bigots? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. one of the like, important beliefs that I have is that being a tolerant, good human doesn't require bullshitting about reality. You know what I mean? Like, that, well, that's, we can, th that's yeah. the, the false choice that we are always given. It, this gets into something really, really kind of primordial and important. I've talked about it on the show before. People have been talking about it for years, which is people want to be nice. They want to be seen as nice. They want to be seen yeah. as a good, nice person. I, I think this also gets into a little bit the, um, the, this thing where, you know, religion has waned in influence and people want to feel a sense of sort of moral superiority in a different way. And so they mm -hmm. see what is essentially just the new dominant religion in the United States, which is wokeness as a way to do that. There's right. a big part of people's identity as being a good person and being seen as a good person. And of course, social media yes. has perverted this endlessly yes. because now we are constantly right. morally displaying ourselves. That is what virtue signaling, which I think is one of the phrases of the century is. And... So there's this very unfortunate thing where whichever side can convince people this is what makes you a good, nice person wins. And unfortunately, it is much easier to do that with, oh, uh, you know, it, it's just it's only kindness to call someone by their preferred pronoun. It's only kindness right. to, to be happy about this biological woman's pregnancy, even though they might look like a man or whatever. I don't even know. How to, you know, it's like it's it's right. it's it's much easier to make the argument that you're being nice and good, right? It's much less, uh, it's, 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 it's like a two-step process. It's like very simple yeah. to just say like, oh, just say the thing, you're being nice. On our end, it's very difficult to explain to people, actually, it is cruel. And I do try to explain this to people, but it is cruel to feed people's delusions. It is not kind. Yes. It is right. absolutely cruel. And we see this with detransitioners now in the most obvious mm -hmm. space that you were bringing up, which is the trans stuff, which is, it, that is, that is unimaginable cruelty what has been done to those young women and young men, which was mm -hmm. taking their delusions about themselves. Which, by the way, I say delusions not even in a particularly aggressive way because these are delusions that they have – I'm talking about detransitioners, people who have acknowledged that it was well, a delusion. It's just delusion by, by like the definition of delusion, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean it's having a belief about the world that is inaccurate. Yeah. And we don't do it yeah. with anything else. If somebody is anorexic, right. we don't tell them like, yes, actually, you are disgustingly skinny. Right. You, you don't need to get endorse. To, like, no, we tell them <laughs> right. like, you're right. underweight. You need to gain a little bit of weight and right. you'll actually be better off that way. We also, thankfully, in most places, we I, I know we do it a little bit, especially in like the pop culture space, but we generally don't when someone is morbidly obese. We actually, most people do not enable that too much. People well, do that's, say, that's yeah. But that's the example that I was going to give because you're making this this very important point about what appears to be kind and how like the the sort of progressive tendency is this very simple immediate appeal to empathy, whereas the conservative response might be a two step. So I think obesity is a good example because look, like I understand it is outre at best and and just absolutely rude at, at I mean maybe even worse than rude at worst to tell somebody you're obese and it's gross. I, you know, I don't think we gratuitously, gratuitously should do that. On the other hand, it isn't good to laud obesity or to pretend that it's equally attractive as Cindy Crawford or something, which is what we apparently, the place we are in culture now is we have to pretend that these massively overweight models are attractive. Now, this is what Jordan Peterson I saw on Twitter. I didn't really follow it closely, but he made this comment about this somewhat larger Sports Illustrated model, and it caused a, an absolutely furious backlash. Now, I thought it was a little odd, though, I would say in that case, because that model wasn't morbidly obese. She was just a bit larger, and actually, I think there were probably men who would find her perhaps equally attractive, but there are some models who are actually like grossly unhealthily obese. And I'm not going to celebrate that. I have aesthetic preferences. I'm not going to lie about them. On the other hand, I'm not going to walk up to somebody in the street and say you're no, I ugly, agree. but I, I do not think we as a society should pretend that all of that is healthy. It, re it really reminds me of doctors recommending smoking cigarettes, right? Yeah. Like, no, no, we don't have to do that. And actually, as you said, it is cruel to do that because what we need to do is create the incentives that steer somebody toward a healthy lifestyle as best we can. Yeah. I'll tell a little bit of a, a personal story on this note. Just I myself was at one point in my life when I was, uh, when I was at my peak weight, 
which was in like late high school, I was probably, I'm, I'm, I'm not particularly tall. I'm like 5'10". I'm like average height. I was probably like 230 pounds. I was a big boy and I was fat. I was not, I was not a, a, a linebacker. I wasn't like healthy fat either. I was like, you know what I mean? I wasn't playing football. Right. I was sitting around playing video games and eating Cheetos. My father had to have a conversation with me about that. He did it in the best way he could. I don't even think he used the word fat, which was probably well advised with a, a teenage boy. <laughs> right. But yes. he did, I believe, use the term overweight and mm -hmm. have a discussion with me about my, by the way, my dad is also a, a medical doctor. So that probably helped in, you know, his level of authority. Some over that. authority yeah. Yeah. So he explained to me what was happening to my body and what would continue to happen if I didn't make a change. I am extremely glad that that conversation was had with me. I am now at a much healthier weight, still have my struggles. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, we'll see what I eat for dinner tonight. I might, maybe a fried chicken sandwich. Maybe it's my cheetah. Who knows? But you know, I'm, a, but I'm glad that that right. someone told me in so many words that I was fat. Didn't use the word fat, and that's an important part right. of the process. But it would have been cruel for my parents to watch me get fatter and fatter. It would have been absolutely right. cruel. I'm glad that I stopped at two. I mean, two thirty is a lot of people would be like, that's not so bad. <laughs> These days, they'd be like, for a five foot ten guy, that was like I was husky, but right. I was not morbidly obese. I was on a, I was on my way there. And if no one had ever spoken to me about it, I wouldn't be happy about it now. You know, I'd be a right. three hundred pound. You know, like I'd be, I, I'd, I'd be, you know, ten times more likely to die from COVID. And of course, you can't talk about that either. It's, it's, Ooh, it's oh, right. It's that is well, another of, one of the most blatant areas is the the fat stuff. It it is. It's related, but think I I sort of compare it to smoking because like morbid obesity. I mean, we'd have to look at all of the studies, but like it's very unhealthy, and it's unhealthy yeah. in the way smoking is. And I I can say this: you struggled with weight. I struggled with cigarettes. And people didn't tell me, hey, it's awesome that you smoke. That smells really good and it's healthy. No, instead, they scolded me and chastised me and I had to stand in the corner in the rain, you know, smoking my cigarette. And good, I'm glad that they did because it is horrible. It's terrible for your health. Now, it feels really good and I was very addicted to it, but I'm very happy that I quit smoking. I mean, I have one every couple months or so, right? So, and, and basically I quit. I'm very happy that I did. And it's because people weren't lying about it. They weren't affirming my reality. Like, imagine if I said, well, you know what? It's not smoking that kills you. It's the judgment. It's when people judge you for smoking that kills you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, they're both physical, biological realities about the human body, right? Because it's because what that phraseology that is used suggests that there is no scientific component to this. Like you could use that argument for other things that maybe it's about judgment. But no, these are purely scientific realities. Smoking and being obese are bad for you. Right. There's no right. possible way to argue otherwise. The thing right. with, um, it is interesting when you get into, um, it, there's some subjectivity to it. The, the picture that Jordan Peterson brought up, which I was only critical of that because I just think that's not what Jordan Peterson should be doing with his time. I just think that he has, <laughs> he's better in a long format. I think he's taking a break sure. on Twitter. I'm very happy about that. Yeah. He's not, because yes. the, the way he phrased that sounded not like him. It was very yeah, it, odd. It, it, but I, you yeah, know, I thought what agreed. he was saying was generally, I agreed with the sentiment. I was like, yeah, we're, we're trying to say that these things are beautiful that the vast majority of people don't find beautiful. It's just kind of funny because right. I actually did see that woman as, pretty large it, it sort of depends on i guess who you ask uh, i mean i wouldn't yes, consider very much so i mean look i've seen fatter people i don't know it, it's it's on a sliding scale but i do think that um the interesting thing about this topic is that there's very much a there's a big discrepancy in private and public this is something where i think actually oh, yes. there are some issues yes. like particularly when it comes to t topics of race and and feminism and a lot of these identity politics topics where it's really um kind of stepped into the private lives of people as well, especially a lot of the way that men and women relate because there's aspects to it when you're trying to date someone. But with the fat thing, it's like men do are gen just generally not attracted to fat women and fat women will struggle greatly to date if they do not lose weight. For what it's worth, fat men will also, I think to a yes. slightly lesser <laughs> extent, but very fat men will also struggle to date. It's another reason I'm glad I lost weight, by the way. Um, uh, I, I will say this, if you looked at a chart of attention from women that Scott was getting, it would correlate very strongly. There'd be like, uh, I'm 230 pounds. All of a sudden, I'm 170 pounds, and it would go like that. It really, it really right. helps. And um, so, you know, it's something where privately, every man and woman on planet Earth would probably admit, like, yeah, I'm not attracted to people who are very overweight. And also, when people, I think this is a good thing, 
uh, a, a small point of optimism. I do think that we are still kind of in control of the vehicle here to where when people have family members who are, unless they are really into like progressive politics, when they have family members who are very obese or overweight, they'll generally right. intervene. I think especially if you are a parent, I think that is still kind of a, a part of your job that people generally understand. But yeah, I think on the fringes, right. it is changing. And, and of, unfortunately, what is on the fringes eventually becomes the mainstream. We are slowly starting to see more of like, you could have a 350 pound cousin. And if you had a conversation about them, their, you know, your uncle might be like, what, what the heck are you doing? Don't talk to them about that. It's their life, you know. Well, I, I've actually, I talk to my wife about this a lot. Like, if you, there are a lot of movies, I, I can think of at least two, Dwayne Hopwood and Little Miss Sunshine, in which they suggest that the authority figure is somehow an asshole because he attempts to make his kid stop eating ice cream or something. So, like, in Little Miss Sunshine, like, the dad is depicted as somehow, like, an asshole because he doesn't want her to eat all this ice cream. And, like... Uh, Steve Carell's character is like, oh, you know, go ahead. And he's like the good guy. But it's like, well, you you don't want your daughter eating like 2,000 calories of carbs for breakfast. I mean, that's not actually a bad concern to have. Um, but I, I think you're right. It's not, it has not pervaded cult. There's probably a lot of it is you're right. There's this kind of dualism. So in public, people may say one thing. But in private, I think everybody kind of understands this. I think what Peterson, I agree with what you said about that particular tweet. And then, you know, with that woman, we can, you know, people can debate the aesthetics of the woman or whatever. But I think what he was probably angry about and why he reacted the way he did is because there is this, this vexing what he called it totalitarian or authoritarian i wouldn't really call it that but this attempt to argue that like your aesthetic preferences are completely arbitrary and we're going to transform them for the better of society and it's weird because i actually thought that this when i encountered this debate first was when i got into evolutionary psychology in like the 90s and they used to debate about like um uh, perceptions of beauty and like how universal and how particular are they and you know a lot of the feminist argue is they're completely particular and the evolutionary psychologists i think with overwhelming data showed no like yes obviously there are culturally bound aspects of beauty but there are certain pretty universal standards of beauty um yep. and it turns out that's still a debate that we're having and i i really do think some progressives see the world in such a way that they think aesthetic preferences are entirely socialized and unjust, and they are working to transform those aesthetic judgments. They think if we put enough of these obese models in the public, that will transform people's brains in such a way that they find this attractive. And I think that's what Peterson was so irritated by. And I, I can understand that, and I, I actually find it irritating as well, um, although it's a difficult, you're, you're right. You, it's Twitter's not the format to make some comment yeah, about yeah. that. Probably not for Peter. Peterson is always better in a long format where he can really yeah, explain. Totally what he's agree. saying. He's not great on Twitter because it's just not. He's he's a, he's a college professor. He he professes. He explain. You know, like that's that's not. <laughs> right. You know, college professors aren't known for being succinct. You know what I mean? Like they give three hour long right. lectures, and which he does in tours all across the country. They're great lectures. I know some friends who've been to them. I haven't been to the one yet, but yeah, it's I I do think it's a it's a bad platform, but I. I generally agreed with the sentiment, kind of like you were saying, which is that there, for me, I will use the word irritating. I'm always very irritated when I see these things that are like, look how beautiful this fat woman is. And, it's just, and to me, it's just like, it's irritating because there's, uh, we were kind of getting into this a little bit earlier, which is there's this thing where something very undeniably provocative is being done, like to put a obviously overweight, arguably obese, I probably wouldn't call that woman obese, but obviously overweight person on the cover of right. a beauty magazine, which for decades beauty magazines have only had thin attractive people that's just how it was for obvious reasons to do that and then be like oh how could this possibly why are you so mad about this like like what like oh what? like that's a, it's a weird thing to do and it's this right. it's this bait and switch that annoys me very yes. much because we we see it in so many ways there is something i will say it, it, you're not even supposed to acknowledge there is something inherently provocative about putting a person who just plainly is overweight and not attractive to most people on 
in a, in a space that is generally been reserved for like, we're going to put a sexy, attractive person here. There's something inherently yeah, provocative about that. But yeah. any acknowledgement of that is seen as like shocking, which is, is so Yeah, it's funny. like slapping somebody and then being like, how dare you get outraged by yeah. that? Now, I mean, like, look, if you, if you stand behind that philosophically, right? Let's say Sports Illustrated in this case. If they stand behind that philosophically, that's fine. They, they can be provocative, and then some people will say something, and they can argue back. And I don't have a problem, but you're right. It's the, uh, you know, this the hypocritical, how dare you say something when we knew exactly what we were doing? And also... The model has to be aware of that. Now, uh, you know, you know, like I, I honestly wish the best to pretty much all humans. There are a few that I, I don't care if they suffer. <laughs> pretty much all humans, including the model. And like, uh, if the, it, but the model has to know. Look, if you're going to do this, people are going to judge your appearance because that's what you're there for. And, and I find this weird. There was like this other. Um, I think this professor said something about this African model and people were outraged by it. And I was like, look, the, when you're a model, you're getting judged on your appearance, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of how that works. I mean, you know, maybe you can argue that you, you shouldn't talk about it publicly, but it just seems odd to present somebody as a model and then say, you can't judge this person's appearance. Yeah. It'd be like, my saying, here, read my book of poetry. How dare you criticize yeah. or it? Or putting somebody as like, okay, they're trying out for the combine. I keep bringing you back to sports metaphors. I miss football. But, I, but I, there's somebody <laughs> trying out for the combine, and they're like, you know, they've got one leg and no upper body strength. They're, you know, they're going out there, and they're not doing very well. And then it's like, well, you know, how dare you criticize their efforts? It's like, well, they probably shouldn't have tried out for the combine if they're like a double amputee right. or whatever. You know, like, it's, <laughs> it's, I don't know if they can be a running back if they can't run. Like, you know, like, there's this weird right. thing where things that are so incredibly obvious, you're just not supposed to mention. We may, You know, yeah. that's actually a good example. It makes me think, because Andrew Luck, I heard an interview with Andrew Luck, the, the um, erstwhile quarterback for the Colts, yeah. and he... he he was talking about how objectified you are by the team before the draft. And it's like, talk about, you know, we think about objectifying women or sexualizing them. And I'm not saying that's always an illegitimate complaint, but like if you're a, trying out for an NFL team, they measure every part of your body. They, you know, they utterly 100% objectifying you. And I think you have to understand. Yeah, because they're investing potentially 35 million dollars in your body <laughs> it was uh, the worst example of taking that i mean you know andrew luck was just kind of talking about his experience i'm sure he wasn't you know crying right. on the floor about it colin kaepernick everyone's fl yes. favorite erstwhile quarterback yes. of the 49ers oh, he did right. the thing where he was comparing it yes. i mean it was not yeah. subtle Fantasia. was the thing that got me about it was that the video <laughs> no. literally everyone listening you you can look this up there is a video that colin kaepernick did which is one of it's in my like top 10 most insane videos of all time it because it is so so you'd have to be mentally ill to find it persuasive like i'm sorry but it, it was a video <laughs> yes. where he compares the NFL combine to slavery. Now, he does not do this in a subtle way. He does it by cutting back and forth from, you know, people getting their arms measured in, in, the, in the combine and before they're drafted or whatever, to directly cutting to footage of reenactments of slave trades, of slave auctions. Right. And I was like, there are, there are, I can think of so many reasons within 30 seconds. If you just said all the reasons that this is wrong, 30 seconds, I could just go. <laughs> like, like there are so many things that separate, yes. the, not, not just, just to start the fact that the salary of a slave is zero and the salary of the people getting their arms measured for a minute while they're fully clothed and being talked about in glowing form by the announcers, which did not happen for the slaves, I'm afraid. They were talked about in kind of a different way. The salary for them might be $35 million a year if it's Patrick yes. Williams or whatever. Yeah. And that was just one of the most bizarre things. One thing I wanted to ask you about before, I know we're getting to the end of our time, Bo, but there's with the, we were talking about the models, and I realized we, we left out one thing that is, I can't leave it out, is not only have there been these uh, overweight models or these, these larger models, if you if you will but uh they've been doing models who have like vitiligo and are like amputees and stuff sometimes both at the same time and i've been have you seen that where like i've been in a clothing catalog and i'm just like oh this model has like pretty no, severe actually... vitiligo or or very like blotchy skin or whatever or is like older like a, like an elderly per uh -huh. and it or like is an amputee and 
again, it's one of these things where I find it odd. I'm not enraged by it. Part of me is kind of happy for them. I'm like, oh, this person has like a condition that probably made life very hard for them. I'm kind of happy that they, mm -hmm. you know, but, and, it, and by no fault of their own, but I notice it and I, and a part of me does go like, what the hell? Like, what, what does it, does this make me want to buy these jeans? Like, is this, like, what, what now is that? It's yeah, particularly that's odd. It's rarer, but I do see it. So I have, uh, this, half this conversation makes it seem as though we're obsessed with models and <laughs> what's going on in the model world, which I'm actually not. Um, it's just, maybe it's a, it's a very concrete well, everyone shops thing for talk. clothes. I mean, you see the mannequins yeah, and that, the models. Yeah, that, it's like, that's, that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I actually don't really shop. I <laughs> press a button on Amazon and I get don't really t-shirts, but yeah, but, um, I I have a kind of mixed view about this though because although as I was saying like I do think there is a universal aspect to human aesthetic judgment I do think there's some particular features of it and actually I'm I'm in favor of maybe not airbrushing the models so much and even showing some uh, different looking people I I don't have a problem with yeah. that I really don't I I Especially because, like, there's an important difference between an amputee and a very obese person. With the amputee, you're talking about somebody, you know, like, I'm thinking of that um, blonde surfer who had her arm bit off literally by yeah. a shark. Okay, like, that's not unhealthy. I mean, you don't want to get your arm chomped off by a shark, obviously, but we're not talking about an unhealthy thing that might we might see. It would not encourage endorsing. people to go and get their arms bitten off by sharks. Right, people aren't <laughs> like, you know what? I might want to do that. <laughs> Whereas the obesity one is, it's coupled with this, uh, this attempt to silence honest discourse about the fact that obesity is not only unattractive, but also unhealthy. And and that's the thing that I have a bigger problem with. So, because I've, I've often thought this about, like, if you compare American to European films. In American films, everybody is, like, a freaking supermodel now. You know, you watch, like, the remake of Friday the 13th, and everybody is so attractive, and it's just... I'm like, man, can they get some normal people? Like, I don't have a problem with that. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Like, you remember when Bruce Willis could be an action hero? And yeah, he was a good looking guy, but he was also balding and a chain smoker. And yeah. that, yeah. And that was like pretty cool. <laughs> so I, I'm all for a, 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 a variegated, yeah. you know, a, a mo mo magazine of models. Um, I, I actually find that I, I, ha I haven't, by the way, I, I just had not seen this, but I have, I've lost t touch with 90% of pop culture, I'm afraid. So I just don't notice don't these you. things anymore. But I, I would, you know, look, it's complicated. We can talk about it. But I, I think, I kind of like that, actually. Am I, is my inner, like, leftist heart beating <laughs> through? <laughs> no, it's, it's not a bad point. I mean, I, I would say this. I think that if, it, look, if I saw a guy, look, I'm not a supermodel. I don't have a six pack abs under here. I'm not going to lift my shirt up, but it's, 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 I'll tell everyone, believe it or not, I don't have six pack abs. You usually only see me from the shoulders up, but no, there is not a six pack under here. And, you know, if I saw a guy like me with kind of, you know, kind of, you know, my hair gets kind of dry and I, I get acne or whatever. If I saw that in a model, I, I would be like, oh, that's kind of cool. This guy looks like me. It actually helped. And by the way, it, the functionality of the model is to help you imagine what you would look like in the clothes on some level. That's mm -hmm. what I was kind of alluding to before. So I'd be like, this actually helps me a lot see what I would look like in that polo or whatever. The right. thing that I, I think about it is it's a thing where it might be like, it might be a, a genuinely nice thing that they're doing where I would describe it as like right for the wrong reasons. Because I do think there's an element of it where it's like they're trying to um, you know, drum up publicity about the fact that they have a model with vitiligo or an amputee model. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of like, and this happens a lot in a capitalist society is people end up doing something that is good, but for, with bad motives. And I, and well, but that's, that's the beauty of capitalism is that the motives don't matter. That, you know what there I mean? There you go. <laughs> but but th this seriously, I want, I, I think listeners should, I, I think this conversation actually gets at this huge, I mean, we could talk about this for five hours, but there is this huge thing that I've been very interested in. I know other people have too. I'm not acting as if this is a novel insight, but this kind of interesting and ubiquitous egalitarianism that suggests we can't make judgments about almost anything anymore. You know what I mean? Like that, I think this is, is somewhat a part of that. Now, in Sometimes that leads to good consequences, right? And sometimes I think we make too many judgments, perhaps, yeah. that are 
you know, maybe they're arbitrary or they're, they're mean spirit or whatever, but you know what? Some things are just better than other things. And like, I, I wish we could just say that and then like sort of deal with reality. Like, yeah. like you know, be, be the stern dad who tell. like, I remember my, my dad telling me, you're never going to make baseball. You're not playing baseball. It's not going to happen. And I remember my mom was just appalled and horrified by this, but like, he was right, and it's silly not to say these things. I'm like, look, uh, Shakespeare is better than you know any student in your class at poetry. That's just reality, and we, we should be able to make these judgments. Now, as a conservative, I, I tend to actually like the judgments and like the hierarchies that we build, and I, I get pleasure in looking up to people who are better than I am. And I, I suppose that, you know, part of the psychological profile of a, a progressive is perhaps that they don't, they dislike that, they get envious, I don't know. Um, but that's an important topic, I think. And I think it's affecting a lot of these things with the way that it's it's just seen as almost uncouth to make these judgments or just to state obvious yeah. truths about some things being better than others. Unfortunately, there's a big generational gap. I'll say as a, as a millennial, I'm, I'm sort of on the line between millennial and Gen Z. I'm pretty sure I'm like a young millennial though. And I will say that, man, was there a lot of emphasis on like, don't you go saying that you are better than anybody else or that anyone is better than you. <laughs> and it was, it did work both ways, which is uh -huh. interesting. It makes it a little more interesting, right. but it, it was this mantra when I was younger that I, even when I was a child, I thought was stupid. Like it's actually pretty easy to, to know that that is kind of not like when right. I was a kid, I would be like, people are better than me at stuff. I'd be playing dodgeball. I'd be like, somebody's kids are just better at dodgeball. And I'd be doing right. whatever that I'm better at. I'd be like, I'm clearly better at that. Like, like I would also think about it in terms of like, well, I got an A on this test and this kid got a B is my grade not better than it. It's, it's such a, I mean, this gets into very basic, like, you know, Marxist and, and other ideologies where everything has to be equal. It's the inherent concept of equity. It's this overarching ideology that people have broken down a little bit, but that does kind of rule our society to an extent where, yeah, nothing can be better than anything else, which is wacky. The same way that the diversity stuff we were talking about before was. It, it's it's inherently wrong. Um, we could go on for hours, Bo, but I know that we, we had about an hour, and I, I do want to try and stick to that. Um, it's good to have you on. I, before we, we sign off, Bo, I wanted to ask if there's anything you want to promote. I, you have a Patreon, right? Yeah, let, let the people know how they can support you, where they can follow you, and what you're up to. <laughs> I do have a Patreon. I don't know the address, but you can find a <laughs> link to it on my pinned tweet. And I should say that what I've been doing is I try to write an article every month for Colette, and then I try to do a roundtable. So that is something where I have at least three to four people Mo I'm trying to find people who disagree so we can have a sort of cordial but lively debate about some interesting question. So, for example, this month's question is, do animals have rights? And I found about four people who disagree in various ways about that. So I try to do that. That's what I'm trying to do. And then on the side, I'm working on my book still. All right. Everybody check that stuff out. Bo, so good to have you on once again. Thank you for... Thank you. I appreciate yeah, thanks it. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you're on iTunes, you know the drill. Five-star review helps get the show to more people on YouTube. Like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you thought of today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time on the Veritas Podcast.